Okay, so um, so yeah, I just want to welcome welcome the audience members and of course our panelists as well. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, so this is the third panel of uh, Big Data's digital discussion series on COVID nineteen and food security and the big data solutions um, that are available or have been discovered during this period. So um, it focuses on challenges and solutions to input supply chains and on farm realities. Um, so we've launched this online discussion series to bring emergent research and on the ground realities together in conversation in order to map out the direct impacts of COVID-19 across food value chains and to glean data-driven recommendations and solutions. So we're very well happy to welcome uh, Ram Julipala. He's the digital agriculture theme leader at the International Crops Research Institute for the Semi-Arid Tropics, or as many know, ICRASAT. Um, Madina Amin Hussein, she's a founder and CEO of the Global Nature Conservation. Um, and Jonathan Stenke, uh, research fellow at the uh, Alliance of Biodiversity and SIAT, and Shreya Argawal, who's the director of strategy at Digital Green. So uh, before we get started, just a couple a couple things, uh, a little bit of house cleaning. <laughs> So uh, all of the attendees, we really welcome you to engage with the panelists. Um, you have the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens. So if you have any questions of the panelists, um, please just pop them in there and we'll be sure to not miss your questions. Um, what we'll do, we'll have each of the presenters uh, present and, and right after the presentation, there'll be an opportunity for Q&A. So make sure you have your questions ready for that moment. Um, we also have a share board that we invite you to um, participate in. And basically, you know, we were, we're looking to facilitate partnerships and connections so that we can work together to solve, um, you know, food security challenges because of this pandemic. So we really encourage you all to reach out to each other, to connect and, and you know, collaborate uh, where you can. So I'm just going to pop now into the uh, Zoom chat a, a link to an Excel document, so you can add your um, name, your email, uh, your organization, and also just maybe there's a there's a field there for any challenges that you've um, found in your work or or you know your area of expertise, and there's also a space to um, to make any notes about any solutions that you found. Um, there's also a, a field for um, for you to add any uh, notes on. Um, on how, what kind of connections you're looking for, or also maybe something that you can offer. So I'm just gonna pop this into the screen here, so feel free to fill that out and, and connect, connect with each other. So um, first, before we start, of course, we're gonna do a nice screensho uh, screenshot. Hannah, who's helping to moderate, um, perhaps you can take the screenshot, and you should be in it too, so turn your video on. <laughs> So on the count of three, just give a nice wave and and um, and we can get this get a nice shot here. So all right, here we go. Three, two, one. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, looks great. Fantastic. And with that, take it away, Ram. Uh, okay. Wait. Yes. Let me first give you a proper introduction introduction sure. to Ram. So Ram, he's the digital agriculture theme uh, leader at ICRASAT in Hyderabad, India, where he also leads their iHub Innovation Center. So iHub is a digital incubator where tech startups, researchers, private sector com companies, and government officials meet and share information related to agriculture and extension, as well as ideas about how to reach farmers more effectively. Uh, Ram, is a strong, Ram is a strong believer in partnerships and has managed complex back, um, projects that bring together people and teams um, with diverse skills and backgrounds. And this is so important when it comes to working on such complex problems that a pandemic like this has created. So please, um, really excited sure. to hear about your, your experience. Sure. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Maria. And thanks for the, for the great introduction. So I'm just quickly sharing my screen. Uh, let me know as and when you are all able to see it. You can see it? Okay. 
so that's the title i'd just like to draw the attention of uh, everyone to this little uh, you know uh, infographic or whatever you call it to the right you know this is like a very popular whatsapp joke that's been circulating around right which says who led the digital transformation of your company the three options are ceo uh, the cto or covid 19 and i am sure most of us agree that you know even organizations like uh, cgar which were very alien to work from home cultures right we are today forced to actually connect from home look at the way we are all meeting right i think that's a testimony to what covid 19 has really done right i i know it's caused a lot of uh, adverse outcomes as well but you know trying to find some silver lining i think it has taught us uh, a lot of new capabilities that we can achieve right so i just like to start my presentation with that uh what i what i'd like to do is like to give the audience a quick introduction into you know uh, some emerging trends that we are witnessing you know these are market based i mean these are these are evolving on the go so uh, firstly i think this is how digital has really impacted agriculture in a win big way i think most of us agree that extension uh, has been one of those areas within agriculture that has really uh, lapped up uh, icts in a very big way right uh, and uh, to speak about couple of examples icrisat itself you know um, i don't want to go through all the bullet points on this presentation i speak a lot uh, as marian introduced um, i lead the digital agriculture research team at icrisat so we we have been studying this space of uh, e extension for some time uh i do have some bullet points and learnings that we have observed but what because uh, the topic of today's uh, talk is more about how we are using icts uh in light of this covid pandemic i'd quickly like to draw the attention of audience to the bottommost part of my slide where you know uh, there is a tool called the intelligent systems advisory tool that icrisat has been using for the last 3 years but just that the frequency and the intensity with which we have been using this tool in light of this pandemic has just gone many fold uh, currently we are uh, we are servicing about 8000 farmers we are sending weather based uh, context specific and crop specific advisories using this particular tool uh, we've not only used this tool just in india but you know in light of this pandemic we actually rolled out this particular platform uh, in another project of icrisat uh, based out of kenya which is called the accelerated value chain development project uh, so as soon as uh, the the contours of this pandemic and the contours of the lockdown were emerging we quickly set up the isat tool in kenya and we are actually doing you know setting set up some advisories for about 20000 farmers uh, in kenya using this particular ict platform that we created and uh, you know we to date we have actually delivered over 150000 advisories uh, using this particular platform just because you know the field functionaries that were hired for the abcd project were not able to dispense their responsibilities on account of the lockdown so that's a quick uh, so i think extension is traditionally one area which has been experimenting a lot with uh, digital tools but i think covid has confronted us with such challenges that you know both farmers and the researchers and the traditional extension system we are kind of forced into a situation where we are learning and coping up with using technology uh, to overcome the uh, challenges that we are facing so that's a bit of a thought on extension moving on another big area that you know has got impacted on account of the covid lockdown in india has been particularly the input value chains right um, and this is where again we are also seeing some very interesting market led opportunities that are kind of cropping up so to the right i uh, this is a piece of news uh, that came in the local newspaper a uh, bear crop science actually tied up with an agtech startup called agrostar uh, to deliver their products to farmers during this lockdown uh, during this lockdown so agrostar is is a typical amazon for farmers you know it it basically provides farmers with an opportunity to buy seed pesticide or any other inputs using an amazon kind of a platform of course it's lot more simplified so that it caters to you know a, a, a an, an average farmer who has who is technologically challenged right but i think what this particular opportunity between you know partnership between bayer and agrostar really signifies is uh, how you know the market is being forced to start looking at digital technologies to to basically construct back those input value chains which practically had come to a standstill because of the lockdown you know so that's another big trend so i think input value chains are another big thematic area where digital can have a very big impact and you know examples are emerging the third big opportunity i think this is particularly very important for india because you know if you know indian agriculture a bit uh, 
April and May are the harvesting time. That's when most of the farmers, you know, traditionally harvest their crop, transport it to the spot markets, which we call as mandis in India, and conduct their marketing operations. But just because of lockdown, suddenly, you know, the transporters who typically, you know, transport the harvest from a farmer field to the to the spot markets had disappeared. The traditional labor that was engaged in harvesting of produce had, you know, disappeared. So at every leg of, you know, the, the farmers were facing all kinds of challenges. But again, here also there are some very interesting, um, uh, you know, trends that actually came up on their own. Uh, again, I have a couple of uh, examples that I've been able to capture from popular, uh, uh, you know, newspapers in India. For instance, there are a number of uh, case studies that are emerging as to how farmers were using simple tools like a Facebook or a WhatsApp or somebody was using Twitter to basically, you know, find the buyers using these digital platforms, right? And in the process of trying to you know salvage their produce they actually unearthed a whole new opportunity i mean traditionally we've been used to this narrative that you know all agriculture output chains are all intermediated and farmers are not able to capture a bigger share of the price that is paid by the consumers more so in the uh, you know the agricultural systems of the uh, of the developing countries but what this pandemic has done has really pushed farmers to the edge and really, you know, uh, in some ways has forced them to, you know, to really adapt to some of these new age tools and, you know, explore some interesting new ways of marketing their produce. Another big example also I would like to, you know, uh, draw the attention of the users is like, for instance, you know, uh, as Marian mentioned, I run an incubator in, uh, in India. It's called iHub. Uh, we have a few interesting startups and the state government of Telangana, uh, you know, where we are based out of, that state government actually partnered with a startup that we have incubated and you know the governments are also increasingly a little more open to partnering with uh, startups which were kind of taboo for them in the past right so in some ways the pandemic ha has also forced the actors in the agricultural marketing systems to start looking at opportunities that are aided by digital tools and technologies quickly move to the my last slide uh, another big area where I think digital has really uh, made a huge impact as far as agriculture is concerned is, of course, peer-to-peer -peer collaboration and, you know, has brought in, has actually realized this concept of the sharing economy. I'm sure Uber has been like the like the poster boy of, you know, or, you know, the, the poster boy of the whole sharing economy context. I know some of you are not fans of Uber. I'm just taking that purely as, a, as an example as to, you know, demonstrate it. But India also has seen some very interesting trends during this lockdown time. For instance, I have seen a number of Uber kind of a models where, you know, another big challenge with this pandemic has created is the uh, lot of the labor markets have basically collapsed. You know, in India, like if you, if you, if a farmer had to do some spraying operation or, a, you know, or an agronomy operation, they're traditionally dependent on informal labor economies. Suddenly because of the pandemic, that informal labor uh, economies have crashed. That's where we have seen some examples as to how some startups that are using drones to do some spraying or, you know, to do some basic agronomy operations are also suddenly started coming up in small clusters. And the interesting thing is how they are borrowing the ideas of Uber to basically, you know, because no single farmer will be able to buy a drone. That's where the whole idea of sharing uh, and using, you know, spraying as a service. These are some buzzwords that have actually started emerging in the market. So this is another very interesting um, uh, trend that we have seen as to how the, the actors in the agricultural systems have started using digital platforms to facilitate better peer-to-peer -peer collaboration and to, you know, as a, as using digital tools as a means to collectivize or aggregate their produce and then using that you know, aggregated produce as a means to, you know, to start finding potential buyers, right? Again, uh, also the central government also, you know, has, uh, has actually rolled out a national level platform where it is trying to, you know, uh, set up an Uber kind of a platform where farmers are able to access transportation services, you know, in this whole conversation, uh, you know, in this whole talk about agriculture, we somewhere fail to, you know, appreciate the importance of logistics for effective functioning of agricultural value chains. I think that is where this whole digital platforms are plugging in and bringing in those, uh, you know, Uber kind of a model. So finally, this is my last slide. I'd like to wrap up, you know, these are some quick lessons that I've learned basically by by neutrally observing and watching this space for some time. Uh, one of my favorite uh, catch line is, you know, I always say, fall in love with the problem and not the solution. A problem with uh, technologists trying to create solutions for agriculture is we take a very technology centric approach to solving problems when the, the reality could be, you know, all you need is simple tools which can actually solve a very genuine problem. So to that extent, I think it's important that 
we should learn to you know really uh, you know place the problem in the social and the economic realities of the farmer right uh, it's important that solutions are simple and user friendly but it's it, you, solution should not also be very simplistic as well and digital solution should actually blend in with the social and economic realities of farmers right i think that is another key lesson that we basically learned by really analyzing and separating out those initiatives that have really worked on the ground vis a vis those which have royally failed so this is a very important lesson that we've learned of course other things like rapid iterations and prototyping backed by evidence and feedback are, are definitely you know uh, are Uh, it, 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 this is another important critical feedback that we basically learned from all our experience uh, last uh, but not the least um, i'm sorry I, human and institutional capacities are equal if not more important right so i think i'm almost at the top of the 5 minutes that is allocated to me i know uh, my apologies if that was a bit of a rush but i'm happy to take questions later thank you so much ram that's fantastic it's so interesting to hear um you talk about um how these we need to be looking more at more simple solutions because yeah. that's one thing that definitely the digital agriculture movement it it garners a lot of criticism for the top down um solutions rather yeah. than bottom up so i mean would would you be able to speak a little bit more to that and also perhaps i i know you have this great anecdote um <laughs> of a of a farmer in hyderabad maybe you can also use that as a bit of an example sure. sure so uh, very simple you know that, thanks for uh, calling out that anecdote so this anecdote is uh, you know i was speaking to this founder of kalgudi and he that chap traveled to some very remote areas of a state called maharashtra and he was interacting with a farmer he asked the farmer you know do you know uh, you know do you know about internet so he was asking him all kinds of questions related to internet connectivity the farmer didn't know what internet was and he was having a blank face but the farmer was using whatsapp was using facebook right i think that was a real eye opener i think we very often underestimate uh, the 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 creative and innovative capabilities of uh, even the you know the technologically challenged farmers ultimately i think necessity is the mother of all invention uh, i have a slightly different take i mean if i if i mean it, people can be critical but if your solutions don't work um, i don't i don't generally believe that uh, there's a problem with uh, the farmer probably you know it's, it's just that we haven't really understood uh, Uh, you know the farmers you know you, you you haven't really mapped out you know how the information that you are the intervention that you are trying to deliver how does it sit in a larger scheme of things for the farmer right for instance you know you got to do uh, from sowing to harvesting there are tens and 20 you know there are hundreds of things that a farmer needs to do your intervention might be addressing just uh, you know it might be a one off at a as a single at a given point in time right uh you can't just expect the farmer to suddenly pay a lot of attention and give a lot of importance to that single intervention right so in that sense i think it's it's important to realize that you have to engage the farmer all through the season i think that's that's adequately um, uh, it's learned within this community at large nowadays and second thing i think the intervention that you deliver has to be contextualized in the larger social and economic scheme of the things for the farmer because after all what we are dealing with is the livelihoods of the farmer and any adverse any intervention that fails uh, can have adverse outcomes for the farmer right and the farmer like you and i they are risk averse nobody wants to live a life with a risk you know with, with a sword hanging down their throat right so we have to appreciate the social and economic context in which small holder farmers operate and that is why i always like this phrase from yuri levine where he says fall in love with the problem right a lot of successful startups i have seen spend a lot of time they do a lot of field work they really understand the problem inside out right and their interventions might look very simple right but there's a ton of thinking and a ton of strategy that has actually gone out into the way they've actually designed the intervention and personally i would like to see cgir being that uh, you know that torch bearer of this kind of a research because i'm sure private uh, sector and startups have their own limitation in terms of the amount that they can invest research and i think it is the cgr as a community we are, we are the ones who could actually lead this kinds of research and you know make available this information on a as a public good maybe so, i hope <laughs> i have not digressed from what you are asking <laughs> no uh, that's fantastic ram and i'm sure jonathan being another uh, cgir member um will have something to say about this for sure 
Um, uh, so first, I just want to open up the panel now to the floor to any um, any of our audience members who want to put through a question. I just wanted to, to make a quick note uh, to uh, Vivek Saraf. I, I know, I think you had your hand up earlier. I just wanted to ask if you have a question, just be sure to pop it into the Q&A. Uh, we won't be um, opening up uh, the the microphones for the for the audience just yet, just just for uh, noise and and also just to be sure that your question comes through nice and clear. Um, so please do pop your question into Q and A. We would be very happy to hear it. Um, I have a first question here from uh, Gerjan. He or uh, he she she says, um, uh, what experience culturally, for example, the use of concepts in digital tech versus the world of the farmer slash or the concept of prior informed consent in relation to, to data use. Um, I'm not sure, I, I'm not sure exactly. I, I guess he's, I guess he's referring to like maybe some of the obstacles that, that you come across or, or um, uh, related to some of like the cultural, uh, cultural elements and then also just looking at what are like the, uh, any issues related to informed consent in, in relation to data use. Sorry, Ram. <laughs> That's a question for you. <laughs> it's a question yeah. for me. Yeah. I, I, could, you, could you just come again on that? My yes, apologies. Yes, I'm sorry. I think I, I have misunderstood this for a little bit. So I guess yeah. he's asking, what is your experience um, regarding, like, uh, what's your experience culturally in like, uh -huh. social environment, in the social environmental context? So I guess use of concepts in digital tech versus, versus the world of the farmer. So, for example, the concept of prior informed consent in relation to data use. Okay, okay. Uh, that, that I think is a very valid question. And to be very candid with you, I think uh, uh, the response to that is still evolving. Uh, I think there are, uh, you know, I can, you, you will have smart people arguing for it and against it as well. But as, a, as, as someone who very firmly believes in the potential of digital technologies to transform agriculture, I would, of course, I, I do respect uh, issues of data privacy. I do respect that farmers, you know, uh, there needs to be an informed consent. Having said that, you know, tech is, uh, you know, also allows you opportunity to create interventions in that sense. You know, for instance, um, at least our experience is, uh, you know, we do a lot of data collection from the field and for the last two or three years in ICRISAT, we have also, you know, we are also taking a lot of informed consent while we are collecting the details of the farmers. What we are trying to do is uh, generally when you demonstrate, you know, confidence to farmers that their data will be used for the right purposes in most, uh, be it in Africa or be it in Asia, I think farmers do understand that uh, when organizations like an ICRISAT or NGOs or other agriculture development organizations are actually coming and placing themselves in that part of the world, I think farmers do appreciate that there is a, a sense, uh, you know, there is a positive connotation that is associated with it, right? So generally, we there might be some element of skepticism, uh, but the plain old methods of advocacy and trying to, you know, capacitate the farmers and building their awareness, building that confidence, I think all of that does add uh, uh, some element of confidence to the farmers, right? So that that's more on the last mile. Uh, but on the back end, I think, you know, a uh, lot of the cloud service providers are today coming up with better technologies uh, so that, you know, after all, you know, most countries like Europe is very strong on the GDPR compliances, et cetera, et cetera, right? Most countries have fairly sophisticated uh, data compliance and data privacy legislations, right? So it's not as if once we get the data, we are going to misuse it or anybody is going to misuse it. There is after all some governance around it, right? Uh, having said that, you will you'll randomly keep hearing of instances where things have failed, but that's where this whole process of evolution, technology keeps on evolving. You know, it is some of these hackers who actually keep making systems better. Uh, that's the unfortunate reality. I'm, that's my long answer to your short question. <laughs> Thanks, thanks, Ram. Uh, it, it's a very interesting topic, and I just want to say thank you again to uh, to who put that question forward. But you know, one thing I just also wanted to comment is that um, because of our immediate and urgent reliance on digital tools and data um, recently, there have been some great advances because 
some of these security problems and privacy problems have really um, come to the fore. So that is another thing that that has uh, been a positive outcome is that um, companies are taking, you know, real efforts now to look at their their data privacy and um, uh, security strategies and to be sure that you know those infrastructures are in place and even just looking at you know in the medical in the medical um, in the health sector for example they are discovering new ways to look at data um, and a, a, in a way that's that's anonymous and protected more than before so this is something that obviously of course we are looking to to see how we can also do something similar in the agriculture sector. Um, but yeah, great question. I, I want to just put one more question to Ram. This is from uh, Vivek, just because sure. he had his question, yeah. his hand up for earlier, sure. and then sure. we'll move on to the next panelist. Um, yeah. So uh, he asks, Ram, are there tech solutions out there that control the irrigation based on crop specific water requ requirements? And actually, I just want to ask one, the last part of another question. Um, uh, Sun, Sun Kora, he, uh, he, they ask, uh, what strategies or mechanisms can we use to accelerate the adoption of digital tools to farmers during COVID-19? So, yeah. Sure. Last sure. Question. Yeah, I think uh, my response to Vivek is, yes, there are tech solutions, but, uh, you know, probably a little early. Like, for instance, I am aware of a couple of solutions in India where uh, they are using digital technologies where farmers can repo remotely operate their pump sets, right? Uh, because in India, if you know the context in India, uh, farmers get a seven hour power supply to operate their pumps. And typically, uh, you know, the power is available late in the night. And farmers were having some inconvenience of going to the farm and operating it late in the night. So there are a couple of interesting in innovations. There is a company called Kisan Raja, another company called Avani Gel in India where they are allowing farmers to remotely operate their pump using their phones, right? But I'm also aware that um, uh, there are a few startups, few tech startups, especially, you know, there are companies that are using the IoT technology uh, and using this uh, method called uh, the Penman Montiet method. You know, it's a method of assessing the uh, requirement uh, of crops uh, based on, I think, a few, three or four parameters. And uh, the, the IoT devices basically collect the data of, of those three or four parameters from the field and then there is an algorithm that runs in the back end and that kind of automatically operates the irrigation, right? So that's how the irrigation automation is happening. But I'll also add, I'm seeing that there is a, there is like a, using IOTs uh, uh, for operating aquaculture seems to be a rage. I'm seeing a lot of that uh, that's basically happening, uh, you know, especially in the southern parts of India, perhaps because, you know, aquaculture is also a high value um, uh, business. So that's where you're seeing some early adoption of these kinds of interventions. The second question was, uh, uh, I think, what are the mechanisms to, uh, you know, speed up the adoption of digital tools? Is that the one? Yes. Uh, what strategies or mechanisms can we use to accelerate the adoption of digital tools? Um, See, I think um, my, I've always been a great believer of uh, grassroots institutions. My own research suggests that, uh, you know, if you already had good grassroots institutions, just to give, give you an example, some states of India have, uh, you know, a fairly extensive extension network, or they have some of these state livelihood missions where there are some feet on the ground, right? So there is already some grassroots institutions there, right? Digital solutions, when you roll out, when you blend in your digital solutions on top of these existing grassroots institutions, the uptake, adoption, and the impact seems to be much higher. Vis-a-vis, -vis when you try to roll out digital in, you know, you know, interventions in places where there is nothing, there is no grassroots institutions or there are no basic institutions. So I think there was a paper from World Bank which also you know, used this very good term called analog complement, right? So along with your digital intervention, you also need these analog complements that are already existing, right? So uh, that is my quick answer. So focus on creating the basic underlying social and physical infrastructure and digital in interventions can actually then catalyze the whole uh, development process. Thanks, thanks Ram, uh, thank you so much. So uh, there's a couple of questions that haven't yet been answered, um, but uh, we will put them to the panel again uh, at the end of the session, so, so don't worry. Um, so I, I want to, to welcome the next, the next speaker. Um, that's Medina, Medina Min Hussein. Uh, she's the founder and CEO of Global Nature Conservation in Kenya. Um, it's an environmental organization based in Garissa County. 
that focuses on nature conservation, restoration of degraded ecosystem, and empowerment of women, um, empowerment of women, smallholder farmers, through teaching them about climate smart agriculture and sustainable farming. She is a passionate environmentalist who has won awards for her initiatives such as Mickey Cash and Throw Sea Technology, which she pioneered with the aim of conserving nature while supporting livelihood improvement of pastoral communities. Um, but Madina, thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you'd like, I'll just, uh, if you can unmute your mic. Hi. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so, so uh, uh, this is Madina. I'll just pop. Um, I'll just pop a um, the presentation just up onto the screen. It just has a few few images and some and some facts. So just to, if you give me one, if you if you want, you can start, Medina, and I'll just get set up. Thank you so much. Uh, well, um, uh, already you have introduced me, so I don't have to repeat again. So. Well, we have this program, uh, this project program uh, called Mitikash, and then um, this program is a citizen science project uh, in conservation agriculture, and the aim is to uh, train smallholder farmers, become citizen scientists, and contribute to climate change mitigation, adaptation, and food security. So uh, we test different crop varieties with uh, smallholder farmers, in our region and uh, after testing the crops uh, we we make analysis based on growth rate surplus production uh, yield and adaptability of the crops to the environment uh, then we draft a conclusion on which crop is adaptable uh, for example in our region which is dry land kenya and then from there uh, we after after drafting the conclusion on which crop is adaptable, we work we work with smallholder farmers, and uh, these smallholder farmers we train them on climate smart agriculture and sustainable farming. So uh, some of the things we train on these uh, farmers includes uh, we 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 train them on how to how to grow crops that are very resilient in our agroclimatic zone in Kenya. Uh, so, so that these people are, are able to withstand and uh, uh, withstand the shock of climate change. Uh, so we have uh, this uh, platform whereby uh, we share with the farmers, uh, we share information with these farmers uh, so that uh, every person is able to get the right information about what to grow and what to do in their own local language. Yeah, so, uh, so far, right now, we are working with uh, 1,200 smallholder farmers in our rural areas in Garissa County, that is Kenya. And uh, our plan is to uh, scale up our work and uh, do so that we can we can go and work uh, with guys who are still like people who are facing the same challenges as uh, the ones we are facing uh, right now. So uh, coming to digital extension and how we are trying to include a digital uh, uh, platform in our work, we 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 have a we have a we have a forum uh, a, a forum whereby uh, whenever we want uh, like our farmers, our farmers can access information uh, online and then they are able to get the information uh, read, written or uh, recorded in their mother tongue, in their local, in their native language, so that they are able to understand and articulate what they want and what they want to hear. Like for example, if they want to get the information uh, required in planting of a certain crop or uh, uh, in planting of uh, like what uh, the market, the, the crops that are in demand in the market, uh, they, they can able to access the information very easily. And uh, we also uh, try to 
uh, link them uh, link them to the market so that they can sell their product online uh, without uh, the the issue of having intermediaries in who uh, sometimes who sometimes uh, try to earn or to gain more than the person who spent a lot of time and invested on the crop production who, that that is the farmer sometimes the intermediary opt to gain more uh, because like uh, probably the farmer don't have any information on the market the price uh, the demand of the crop and, uh, and so forth so uh, this uh, platform of ours make sure that the, the farmer get direct contact to the to the market they are directly linked to the market so that they directly sell their products online online and uh, they're able to get their cash or their money uh, without any intermediary or any issue and uh transport uh we decided to create a parcel uh a vehicle that is meant for uh, transporting their their goods uh, to the required market, and then they don't have to they don't have to travel, follow their 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 produce. No, they will just label they will just label their their their, their names on the on the produce. Who is uh, like like which cro which produce is for a certain person? They will just write their names and uh, attach it everything so that these crops or these uh, produce can can reach to the market without uh, their direct contact yeah thank you so much madina um yeah this is fascinating um i i really would love to hear more about um how first of all more specifically um what were some of the challenges that you faced I'm continuing this because a lot of what you do is based around the training, correct? So how were you able to continue this training um, during these times of, of social distancing and isolation? Uh, well, we have, uh, like we use our, our platform. Okay, first we, we have uh, these, uh, the farmers. Uh, we selected uh, group leaders and then these group leaders uh, for example uh, probably the uh, a certain group uh, consists of 50 farmers and then we will engage the farmers uh, based on group so that at least we uh, before we used to visit them one by one but now uh, there is COVID-19 and uh, there are a lot of guidelines social distancing we should not come close and so forth so we use our platform to to make sure that we are able to train farmers uh, through that uh, through 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 use of the platform, whereby we arrange farmers uh, uh, like for, like uh, let's say 50 people are in a certain uh, in a certain platform, and then these people uh, like we we get in touch with them directly. Uh, uh, because we give them uh, a voice message or we video we send them videos so that they can see practically what has to be done yeah that's fantastic um so i'm just going to take the um stop sharing the screen for a moment one, one sec <laughs> and just check if we have some questions uh from the audience here um uh, Okay. One sec. Okay. All right. Technical difficulties. <laughs> um, okay. So I have a few questions here. So, um, okay. So, uh, so first, uh, okay. So from Paul Saladar, he asks, uh, is the drought tolerant? Um, I don't know if this is, I'm not sure, Paul, if this one is specific to Medina, but I, possibly, is it, it says, it, is the drought tolerant plant species genetically modified? Is it a genetically modified species? If so, will that affect endemic species in terms of survival? 
I'm not sure, Paul, if that was meant for Medina. Um, I might just clarify. Sorry, well, he, probably he meant, uh, okay, I can't understand the question well, uh, but uh, okay, after training, after, after testing the properties and making analysis based on growth rates of uh, um, adaptability to environment, yield, and uh, growth rate, we ne then we will conclude, we draft conclusion. Uh, after the conclusion is when we now uh, train farmers on climate smart agriculture. And when we train clim uh, farmers on climate smart agriculture, climate smart agriculture is, uh, sust uh, is securing sustainable food security and the climate change. So whatever our uh, farmers grows are uh, drought tolerant crop species. Mm. Yeah. So, look, Medina, a question from, from me, I guess, um, I mean, what, what is so uh, interesting and so impactful about your work is, you know, how you focused mostly on training, um, specifically on training smallholder women farmers. And, you know, there's plenty of research now, you know, um, and uh, predictions that it will be the, the women smallholder farmers who will be the ones that are most impacted by this pandemic. And can you give a little bit more insight um, on this and how um, Miti Cash and your other initiatives are helping to um, ensure that they are more resilient to this pandemic? Uh, well, um, okay, uh, in our country and uh, in our county, uh, that is Garissa County where I come from, um, women, women, women are um, disproportionately affected by be it drought, be it famine, be it floods, even the COVID-19 has affected women so much because, you know, these are the people uh, who are the first responder to everything in our community uh, because if it is uh, COVID-19 right now, women, you will find a lot of women struggling to feed their families uh, probably some of them are divorces. Uh, they left, uh, they separated uh, from, maybe she separated from her husband uh, because of some domestic violence. And uh, global uh, nature conservation uh, through Mitikash is trying to empower these women uh, through we, we using uh, fruit farming, uh, like we use fruit farming as a vehicle for women. Uh, build their own support system to become independent and empower decision maker. We do this by, okay, uh, before before the COVID, we used to we used to meet and train them on the, uh, uh, on so many issues. Even we decided to train them on pad production, which is eco friendly uh, pad uh, production, so that they can sell this pad and gain something out of it. But right now, uh, with the COVID, we are unable to even meet because of the uh, uh, guide, uh, uh, directives from the government that uh, we should not come in contact. But uh, at least we are trying to um, make them resilient by training, offering the training, uh, the, the digital training. <coughs> we sometimes we send, uh, we send them a video of how things are working. And then probably uh, one person from us, from our company, can uh, have a look at what they are doing to confirm that if whatever they are doing, if, if, the, tr if the video or the video they got uh, through the platform uh, is, uh, is what exactly they are doing in their areas. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, so I have uh, one, one last question. Okay. Uh, Karanja asks, uh, why only women and not men? Um, how effective is uh, the digital uh, the digital platform in the market chain? Um, do they embrace it, or or do they have some doubt um, due to the risk uh, of uncertainty? Okay, the reason as why we are trying to work with women smallholder farmers, majorly women smallholder farmers, is because I come from a patriarchal society whereby women 
are not given a platform to express themselves. Women are not given land ownership. They are not given training. They are not given technology. They are not given land ownership. Women are just there. They have to accept policies made for them. They have to accept things which, like everything made for them. And we can't do that. Because when it comes to uh, climate change or the COVID-19 or any emerging issue, women are the people who are majorly affected they are disproportionately affected and bear the burden of all uh, issues, be it climate change, be it this emerging, uh, the COVID uh, pandemic. So ours, you know, if you train, if you support women, these women uh, will withstand and uh, become people who are empowered, be people who can even use their knowledge and skills to overcome and withstand the shock of uh, so, so many issues that are affecting our society. And the issue of uh, market change, they, they really embraced it because, uh, okay, right now, they have no otherwise. And uh, the, only, the only solution that is there uh, is, to, is, to, is to adapt and become flexible to what is available, like making use of the available uh, opportunities and the resources. Thank you. Thank you, Madina. I, I'm also interested to know um, just more about the role of the women in the community, because I know you have some some statistics you have now. I mean, maybe it's it's more now, but you have trained over 600 women um, on these digital tools. Are, have you found that this is also very effective because often it's the women that that bring that teach that bring that knowledge and then teach it to further, they further that teaching? Uh, well, uh, okay, we have trained them and uh, first they have embraced because they're very happy to, uh, to see or to gain skills on what to do and to make even them flexible. And uh, the other thing is, uh, you know, the digital uh, platform and uh, the digital extension uh, has become very important because every person is able to get information uh, at their own time, on their own, uh, privately, and uh, yes, they're able to get information, uh, like there's a lot of confidentiality in because we deal with uh, one farmer at a go, like uh, if you have to send an information, uh, probably if you want to tell them the market price, uh, crop, uh, what to do, like we send them information. Uh, then before, there were intermediaries in between who used to who used to fluctuate things for the farmers, who even, they normally, they do steal from the farmers because sometimes they cheat, uh, which is wrong. Now they get information on their own and uh, they're able to get profits and everything, yes, for themselves. Thank you. Thank you so much, Medina. We, we're going over time a little bit, um, but really, thank you so much. It's, uh, it's really fantastic to have you come on. I know we've been in touch uh, quite a bit over the past year, so really um, so happy that you're able to join us. Um, so we're going to move uh, on to Jonathan. Um, uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, so I'm just going to give a really quick introduction um, to Jonathan. Um, so he's a research fellow at the Digital Inclusion Team at the Alliance of Biodiversity International and in SEAT. His research focuses on facilitating farmer participation in agricultural research and extension through novel mass participatory methodologies such as citizen science and the use of modern ICT. Um, through user-centered design with smallholder farmers and extension agents in Tanzania and Kenya, he contributed to developing the Ushauri <laughs> semi-automated auto uh, agro-advisory hotline. I'm so sorry if I completely <laughs> pronounce that incorrectly. Um, you can you can uh, tell us the, the the proper pronunciation of that. I think uh, please, we need to ask for Medina Jonathan. for the. <laughs> thank you very much. I think Medina can pronounce Ushauri uh, perfectly, the Swahili word for advice. I. Um, <laughs> So thanks a lot for the invitation. Thanks for um, Rams and, and Medina's super interesting talks and, and a lot of participation, actually. Let me just quickly share my screen. All 
All right, is it working? Yes, looks good. Okay. All right, okay. So I'm gonna um, quickly present a tool that we've been developing at the digital inclusion team at Biodiversity International and see it over the last years. Uh, it's called Ushauri, as I said, it's um, Swahili for advice. And it's um, part of a collaboration we had with the public extension service in Tanzania and uh, another project partner in Kenya, where we try to um, streamline and, and, and reinforce some of the communication flows that are already existing with digital tools. And, and I'd like to um, bring up something Ram said, and which I liked a lot, um, fall in love with the problem, not the solution. So I don't perfectly agree we should fall in love with the, project, with the problem, uh, but you should definitely focus on the problem. And that's what user-centered design is about. So um, what, what we did in Tanzania is looking at the problems with an open mind, with no solution at all. We didn't fall in love with the solution because we didn't have any solution in mind yet. But departing from the problem, we tried to come up with something that really suits um, the local context. So what did we do? Um, as I said, this is about user-centered design. So we looked at what do farms expect from extension and how do they interact with the public extension service? So we saw through interviews and focus group discussions that farmers um, are in favor of direct exchange with extension agents. So they want to be in touch with their local agent. But in, in many regions of Tanzania, um, there's a ratio of three to 4,000 farmers per agent. So that's it's very challenging to get hold of your agent. Basically. Um, then agricultural radio is super popular, it's widespread. But farmers are often in the field, um, they don't have batteries for the radio and they, they miss shows that might be quite relevant. And we saw that farmers have mobile phones, not necessarily smartphones, but farmers do have regular thumb phones um, and they are proficient in using them for calls. So they call their family, and that's a, that's a technology they master. Um, now on the extension side, we see that um, extension agents are actually overtasked with this high number of farmers they have to deal with. So um, this telecommunication between farmers and extension agents is quite common. And during some peak seasons, extension agents receive calls all the time. They, they can't really focus on anything else because they receive calls all the time. And they notice they have to repeat themselves a lot. So on a specific day, you, you might have 10 farmers asking the same question about planting a certain crop, about uh, applying a certain uh, agrochemical and so on. So we, we try to see how can we improve these communication flows where there's a lot of unnecessary transaction costs, basically. And the solution we've come up with um, is an automated IVR hotline. So a, one of these hotlines where farmers call and it tells them press one for topic A, press two for another topic, and so on. It's all automated, giving farmers access to these most common questions. The top 10 questions all the farmers ask can be already pre-recorded and farmers can, get hold, can, can uh, listen to them at any time, even when their extension agent is not available, when the extension agent has no time and so on. Now, in the meantime, for extension agents, they can efficiently manage their communication with farmers through an online platform because farmers can also leave questions. Of course, these 10 topics, for example, that we have pre-recorded will not answer all of the farmers' questions. So farmers can submit further questions and these will end up in an online platform where extension agents can basically like do their emails once a day. So they won't get interrupted all the time during uh, trainings or reporting uh, with calls, they just get all these farmer questions on an online dashboard and can respond to them in bulk. And um, I'll show you later on how that works. So just, just briefly, farmers in Ushauri would just use a regular phone and they get um, access to this server of pre-recorded audios, but they can also send questions. These, uh, these questions will end up um, at an online dashboard for the advisors who would need a computer or even a tablet or a, or a smartphone. And they can listen to these questions, send um, messages back. So they can record a message and send a push call back, back to the farmer. Now, you might wonder, and I've, I've received that question, how is this any better than just picking up the phone and, and having a regular call? Now, the nice thing is that advisors can recycle their answers. So when a, when a farmer question is repeated, um, let's say today a farmer asked the same question as yesterday and the day before, me as an advisor, I can just send the same answer that I've recorded once. I, I did some research. I took uh, 10 minutes to record a really nice message. 
and that message I can send as many times as, as I want. That, that uh, creates a lot of efficiency, allowing advisors to answer a lot more questions and interact with a lot more farmers. Uh, what we're seeing now with COVID is that um, basically all the interaction between farmers and extension services that was through farmer field schools, um, on-farm trainings, on-farm visits, all of this has now moved over to telecommunication in many places with the travel restrictions now. A lot of information flows have to go through farmers' mobile phones. I think therefore it's, it's even more necessary that we harness the potential of, of, well, these efficiency gains, allowing extension agents to communicate with 3,000 farmers through the phone. That, that's not possible through normal calls, but we believe, I believe, that can be organized through this smart uh, combination of different digital technologies. So that's why in Ushauri there's the three levels. So um, the most common topics you see here, that's fully automatized. That's pre-recorded. Farmers can call it, they can call the hotline, listen to the, the messages without any interaction with um, the advisory system. Now with the less frequent but kind of straightforward topics, um, farmers record their question and then advisors see, ah, that's the question I've been getting late, uh, a lot lately. Farmers want to know where uh, to get seeds. I'll send them the, the current answer and that allows the advisor to record it once and send it to, I don't know, 10, 20 farmers at once. And there will always be topics that are too hard to, to just um, record a standard audio for. Sometimes you just need to communicate, ask some follow-up questions. For these, extension agents can really focus on these and have phone calls um, with the farmers. So they can call back the farmers after checking their question on the online dashboard. Now here you see a, um, a screenshot of Ushauri. This is what the advisor sees when they log in. This is their personal dashboard. Um, don't worry, GDPR is watching. So these names are uh, fake names. We've replaced it. Now when a farmer calls, for example, Zain and Yusuf Omari called and um, sometimes we've seen in, in, in well, in, in our experience that farmers um, hang up, they don't really answer, the, they don't really ask a question. In this case, the extension agent sent back the standard audio, hello, explaining how this thing works, please call again. Now we had um, Suleiman Yassin, for example, who asked the question about a certain virus that many farmers in our region asked in, in Southern Tanzania. So Suleiman got back a message about the roseate virus. So this way, once a day, the extension agent logs in, sees the new, just, just like you would in your Outlook, sees the new audio messages coming in and boom, 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 sending back, sending out the, the answers or calling back um, farmers with the more complex question. Um, so the benefits here is no farmer question goes unnoticed. There's no um, missed calls, basically, because all the questions end up in the dashboard. Um, we have a lot of efficiency because we can send out these um, answers to many farmers. And um, advisors attribute these keywords, these topical keywords to farmers' questions, allowing a lot of interesting big data analysis of emerging information needs, um, new diseases that uh, are emerging in certain places. These are some applications that we're currently looking into um, how, we can, how we can really harness the potential of this information. Um, Ushari is a, is a template. We've done this, um, for example, with Groundnut in southern Tanzania. But basically, this system can be used by any organization in any region um, and for any topic, provided it's the right solution. So user-centered design for us meant this was suitable for the context of Tanzania. It might not be the right solution for every place, um, as, as it seems from, from what Ram has been saying in India, for example, many farmers have smartphones, then this might be sort of an outdated solution. Uh, but for now, for example, we're talking to a, a private sector company in Zimbabwe, um, same in, in Colombia, who are interested in, in using this. Um, and I find it quite interesting that actually we've got a lot of interest lately from um, private sector not so much from governments. It seems that um, the COVID response of government is a bit slow also because, probably because of the economic repercussions and governments, especially in developing countries now more than ever have uh, tight budgets to spend. Whereas private sector companies have been approaching us, um, they aren't able to provide the information they want to their customers. Can they use a shouting to communicate with them? 
on that. That's quite interesting insight. Uh, last thing I'm going to say, um, we noticed that a lot of advisors in Tanzania have smartphones, but um, internet connectivity is a bit weak. So instead of a browser-based uh, website that they constantly have to refresh, we are looking into um, developing an app for the next project to require a lot less um, airtime, a lot less internet connection. And uh, we're interested in, in seeing how we can use AI for um, improving or, or speeding up the responses. Um, and we're looking into ways how farmers can also provide a feedback. This information helped me. This information was nonsense. So how can we use some uh, these digital tools to also understand the quality of extension and use that information perhaps to, to um, audit the extension services vis-a-vis uh, -vis the government, for example, showing them that actually farmers are in favor of this service, um, which is an information that is often lacking in extension services. Often governments don't really know whether um, extension services are serving farmers properly or not. Uh, all right. And I think there are some questions that popped up. This is the end of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, first of all, I, I, I'd like to ask one as a moderator. I mean, obviously, I'm very interested to know um, what you have found. I mean, this is a fantastic service, um, advisory service. And, and I'm interested to know, like, first of all, have you had an increase of, in users? Have you recorded a, a, a high increase in users um, since the pandemic? Um, and also, just mm -hmm. have you noticed, like, what, what have you noticed as far as, like, just shifting even the content like the kind of questions that you're getting um you know re recording in the dashboard since the pandemic started yeah uh yeah very good question i appreciate it um the problem with us as a research institute is we we don't have this running um well let's say indefinitely so we since we've been working project-based we've developed this in a project that ended early this year we published a scientific paper about it now we're kind of in a, in a gap phase where we're looking to, for, for new use cases, for scaling. Uh, we're preparing these, these collaborations with our partners, as, as I said, in, in Zimbabwe and Colombia. But currently, we, we're not implementing Ushauri anywhere. So um, part of this discussion series is also, please approach me if you're interested um, in applying Ushauri. Um, but what I can say is that we've been receiving a lot of interest. So um, we've been approached by some organizations that are precisely citing this, this problem. They would like to provide extension. They would pro like to provide information to their customers or their beneficiaries. And they're looking for digital tools to enable this. Um, Harvest Plus, for example, um, that, that's basically one person who um, needs to serve a few hundred or thousand farmers. And um, he told us that Ushauri would be really the right thing to, to organize this in an efficient way. Thank you. So I have a, a few few questions coming up now. So uh, I'll start with Jyoti Singh. Who are the advisors who answer the questions and is it free of cost for farmers? Also, do you have an option for voice recorded messages, uh, questions, or does it have to be in the form of SMS? And what is the, what is the response? I guess, what is the, per, their per, the preferred method for farmers? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Um, so this is a, it's just a tool that anybody can use and we've been developing this together with the public extension service in Tanzania. So in the, in the case I've presented, the advisors were the real public extension agents who are in charge of meeting farmers um, doing farm visits and so on. So they can use this tool to communicate. And it's important to say we're not using SMS at all. So it's all through uh, voice messages because that's something we, we saw in our um, user center design process that farmers, um, even literate farmers, don't prefer using SMS. Um, voice messages is something very intuitive, something um, farmers are more willing or more can more easily adapt adopt pardon, than SMS. So we're not using SMS. Um, and what is the preferred mode of asking questions? Um, actually, farmers were more likely to ask questions than to listen to the IVR. Uh, the existing messages. So we saw actually farmers asking questions about topics that are already available. So they could have just listened to the, the available um, 
uh, uh, audio message. So we saw that this, um, this procedure of recording a question and then waiting for the, for the callback, that's something that was well adapt adopted by the farmers. There's another question by S. Sayan. Yes, I was just muted, muted one moment. Yes, so uh, uh, with this communication platform uh, for the Tanzania farmers, did you provide the information regarding like weather prospects, like, I guess weather forecasts and weather uh, advice services? Yeah, uh, would be a great use case. Um, as said, we, we as a research institute, we just developed this in, in form of a proof of concept, basically. Um, and we worked with a groundnut breeder, uh, a groundnut research institute. So this was about um, groundnut agronomy. Now, um, including weather forecasts, sending voice messages, for example, on a weekly base uh, would, be, would be completely possible. It wasn't the focus of our project, but technically that would be a great um, use case. Okay, I just have one last question here from Aston. He asks why uh, you don't work uh, with a government agency, mm. agriculture, so they can adopt <coughs> your platform. Yeah, thanks, Aston. That's actually what we've been trying to do. So we have we've had a couple of meetings uh, last year, end of last year, um, with people from Tari and from the the National um, Extension Service in Tanzania. Governments are a bit slow um, in terms of allocating budgets, so we're continuing the discussions. My dream vision, of course, would be that a government adopts this, this service and scales it to a national level. Um, so we're trying to get there, but it's, it's taking time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. We're, we're going quite, quite a bit over time already. So uh, we're going to move on to the next panelist. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, any questions that are not answered, we'll, we'll shoot them through to the panelists and, and publish the answers with a summary of this session um, in the next uh, week or so. Um, so the next panelist we have is uh, Shreya Agarwal. Uh, she is the Director of Strategy at Digital Green, which is a global NGO that uses technology and partnerships to support smallholder farmers increase their incomes. Um, DG, DG Digital Green focuses on using participatory videos shared via multiple digital channels to strengthen public extension services. Uh, Shreya has more than 10 years of experience in international development, focused on agriculture and health services across India and Africa and private sector consulting. So thank you so much, Shreya, um, for joining us on this panel. Um, and you're welcome to start when you're ready. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much, Marianne. Uh, it's very nice to be here and sorry for being so over time. So I will try to be quick. Um, so uh, given the introduction, uh, just to say that I represent Digital Green. It's a nonprofit. We've been around since 2008, primarily working in digital extension. And today I'll be talking about uh, our approach and how we're adapting it in this current climate. So similar to what Jonathan said, uh, highlighting the problem of farmers right now uh, and their problems in accessing information, be it agronomic information or information about COVID-19. And uh, at the same time, you have extension agents who are mandated to support these farmers. And even though historically they've used face-to-face -face interactions, uh, they're finding it difficult given the travel restrictions and just given the sheer number of farmers that they're supposed to reach out to. So at Digital Green, we tested an approach called the community video approach. And th that's when we share agronomic practices uh, with farmers via short locally produced videos that are by farmers, for farmers, and they feature farmers themselves. And this is disseminated in short in-person screenings uh, in group settings. Uh, the approach has reached about 2 million farmers, primarily in India and in Ethiopia. And we found that in controlled evaluations has resulted in an increase in the uptake of practices by about 50% versus more traditional government-based uh, extension systems. So you might be asking now, um, 
you know, given COVID, given the mobile technologies that are so prevalent, is such a simple uh, seeming approach still relevant? And it's really, you know, we believe that there are basic principles that underpin this approach that really, if adapted, uh, are more relevant than ever. And I'll be talking about three of these principles in my presentation. So the first principle is partnership and capacity building. And this is similar to a question that was asked around partnering with governments. So the approach that we've really taken is building the capacity of local partners as opposed to completely reinventing the wheel. For instance, in India, we work with government extension systems and we've trained about 15,000 existing extension agents. Uh, this has also helped us sustain and scale the approach uh, with uh, the government interested in embedding the system and therefore investing, co-investing about $23 million of their own money for equipment and trainings, etc. So it's really about building that, that uh, uh, integrated system. Now with COVID-19, we are moving from in-person trainings to uh, um, e-learning e modules shared via mobile phone, smartphone uh, technology, uh, using something called the Virtual Training Institute, which we have now used to train about 1,500 extension agents directly. The second principle is the peer-to-peer -peer learning aspect, as well as the importance of localization. So we have found that it's really about featuring farmers themselves in these locally developed videos, as well as the group-based conversations at the time of the screenings that help increase adoptions. Um, and now that these in-person screenings are not possible, we're also testing, reinforcing this messaging uh, with other channels of communication. So like similar to what Jonathan shared, IVR, as well as online communities on WhatsApp, for instance. Um, in one study that we did in Andhra Pradesh, uh, we found that when we laid IVR on top of video, it led to about a 21 to like a 74% increase in adoption versus just sharing that practice with a video alone. So it's really using these integrated channels of communication that can, that can make a difference as well. And then finally, the third principle that we've learned is that uh, farm and farmer level data can make content more targeted and more relevant. Uh, right now, we have a farmer database of about 2 million farmers where we record demographic, location, activity-based data. And that sort of helps inform, improve our programs and the next iteration of videos that we, we produce. Um, and now we're integrating other forms of farm level data. So like, for example, weather, soil uh, data, along with this farmer data, as well as finding other channels of collecting this data, which are more multi-way. So let's see how these three principles can really come together. Uh, in Andhra Pradesh, uh, we partnered with local nonprofit organizations who are already working with cashew farmers to help their farmers increase yields by reducing the incidence of flower drop. Um, we integrated weather, soil, and farmer level data to provide timely recommendations on when exactly they should spray these organic fertilizers. And this messaging was shared via video, and these were in-person screenings, and this is right before COVID struck, but then we followed that up with IVR and WhatsApp messages. And we've collected farmer feedback through this process, as well as uh, the level of uptake of practices, which has been about 50%. So this, as an example, is just one solution of one crop in one region. And given the scale of the problem, it's really about how can we create these generalizable solutions. And that is why we're developing a tech uh, data platform, which we're calling FarmStack, uh, which, helps, which can help organizations share data with one another. Uh, this is being developed uh, in partnership with the government of Ethiopia. Uh, and will help organizations discover different data sets, uh, clean and convert data, uh, analyze that data, anonymize it, and then finally share it with one another uh, in a decentral way, uh, directly with like data owners and users. So this is still a work 
uh, in progress and um, uh, hopefully we're going to be looking for active collaborations uh, going forward. So with that, uh, let me pause and uh, really welcome any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Shreya. Look, it's such a, I really love this approach of uh, digital brain, this integration of, you know, what Ram was talking about, of like bottom up uh, solutions, but where you are bringing the solutions, but you're really using uh, um, the community there to make sure that they, they, they hit home in the right way. And I think that's just such a fantastic, fantastic response. Um, a, a strategy. So um, I have a question here from Jyoti. Um, they say in India, as you said that you work with over 1500 extension agents, they want to know if this is uniformly spread over India or just in, in some parts. Um, thanks Jyoti. So uh, we primarily in India, we've actually worked across six states. Uh, but we have most presence in Bihar, as well as in Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. And that's where we, you know, we've worked primarily with, uh, in India, there's a flagship program called the National Rural Livelihood Mission. Uh, it's a poverty reduction program where they work with agricultural departments by creating these state missions. Uh, and they have their own cadre of extension agents. So it's really partnering with these state missions and building the capacity of these extension agents that already exist. Uh, so yeah, that's been our sort of primary focus. Um, they also, the same uh, question from the same, same audience member, they want to know if you use satellite and crop models to forecast and share the advisory to farmers. Um, We've done some tests around using satellite imagery, for instance, to figure out um, what is the yield. And this was again done in Andhra Pradesh. Uh, and at least so far, at least in our experience, we found that the precision or the granularity of the data uh, in collecting farm level uh, information was not precise enough for us to enable these targeted advisories. Uh, we still strongly believe that there is an opportunity there, but we need to make sure that it's for the right use case uh, and using the right technology. And having said that, you know, we, of course, I, as I was mentioning, share um, weather related data. Uh, and that of course relies on, uh, you know, what we receive from the meteor meteorological departments as well as satellite data. Thank you. Um, so I, I have a question as well, similar to what I asked uh, Jonathan, but um, so obviously this has been going for, you know, Digital Green has been running this for quite some time. And I want to know like, what have been some of the challenges that have presented uh, during this pandemic um, and how have you combated them? And then also what are some of the opportunities that have arisen? Absolutely. Um, well, one of the things that of course, like our traditional model is supporting extension agents meet farmers in person in groups uh, and that can't happen so we needed to pivot fairly quickly to finding other channels of communication and that's why you know uh, we've experimented with not just ivr but also trying to understand how is it that we can replicate this peer-to-peer -peer learning aspect so for example creating groups on whatsapp uh, for farmers because as you know ram was mentioning now there's greater penetration of smartphones and whatsapp especially is just ubiquitous like everybody has it uh in like especially like sort of more you know uh slightly well off households in rural communities uh, but in terms of challenges i think one of the things that has struck out is the poor market linkages uh, because, and this is again something that Ram mentioned, right? So one is, of course, there's extension issues, but the second is that farmers are finding it really difficult to bring produce to market. And that's an area that we are trying to develop additional solutions on, especially around uh, trying to, uh, with the last mile transport logistics. So, so that's going to be sort of a ne next big focus area for us. 
Thank you so much, Rhea. So look, I'm just going to uh, ask a couple of very quick questions from the audience to all panel members. Um, feel free to answer. Um, I have one from uh, I have one from Tijani from Facebook. Um, he wants to know. Uh, he says he's watching from Farm Space Tech in Nigeria. Um, he wants to know how do how do you collect data where mobile phone and internet and network coverage is low among various rural farming areas in Africa. So perhaps let me actually well. start because I see that Jonathan had asked a similar question to me on how is it that we collect data. Um, just to we've created a system um, called Connect Online, Connect Offline. It's called Coco, which is basically a system where uh, people can go collect data uh, in an offline setting. And then when they do have internet access, they can transfer it uh, online. So this sort of more integrated dual system has helped us at least figure out uh, a, a middle path. And uh, of course, there are some challenges in terms of how it's not real time. Uh, but we try and create systems wherein that data and feed can, can be as near real time as possible. Um, but I'll let Jonathan, Medina, and Ram chime in as well. Yeah, I might just add that um, not, not all mobile phone enabled data collection and, and needs the internet, basically. So IVR just needs regular um, mobile connection. That covers more than 90% of, of Africa already. So there are always these, these white spots. Um, I think we lost Jonathan. Yet, but it's okay. rapidly expanding and I'm, I'm sure in, yeah, I'm sure in a few years, um, entire Africa is covered with regular network. Sure. Um, I'll just add a couple of points on that, uh, Mariam. Um, I do remember, like, if you remember in 2017, when we launched the big data platform, we had a gentleman from an organization called Digital Impact Alliance Limited, DIAL, right? Yes. And I think uh, the call data records, right, they are a valuable data asset. Um, but of course, CDRs are currently owned by the private telecom operators. Uh, but I think DIAL was trying to create this, forge these partnerships where uh, the call data records could probably become, uh, you know, open data sets. Because I think fundamentally, when you can't have uh, primary data uh, coming from the farmer, I do think that some of these secondary data sets like a CDR or, you know, some of this data from the telecom transmission towers, uh, they could be repurposed to answer, you know, to plug in those data gaps. Um, I, I think that is what even Jonathan was alluding to when he meant those white spots, right? And you're also aware of the Inspire grant where uh, we are trying to use the uh, radio waves between two connecting two towers and then trying to you know come up with some kind of a rainfall forecast right so i think there is enough innovation there are enough people trying to you know tweak around with the existing uh, data infrastructure and trying to plug the data gaps probably it's only a matter of time before we are able to address some of these pressing issues in terms of the last mile data gaps that we have Thanks, thanks, Rao, and, and everyone for your answers. I just have uh, one last question from the audience, and then I think we'll finish up because we're quite quite a bit over time. Um, so I have here from uh, uh, Parshatham. Uh, they ask: Is there any provision that small holding farmers with for any small holding farmers with fragment holding for automation technology? Um, so I'm, I, I'm really sorry if, if, if uh, you're still on and um, perhaps you can resubmit the question. I'm a little bit confused about uh, what the what the actual question is there. Um, but uh, I have another question from an, one of our anonymous attendees. Um, they ask in terms of trade, what are the technologies available other than delivery apps um, that, for example, like, and how can we use big data that would benefit both producers like farmers and the consumers? So urban rural dwellers. So I guess like other than delivery apps, like what other technologies are available and how can big data help um, uh, facilitate those technologies or contribute to any panelist? <laughs> so when he says delivery apps, uh, is he kind of alluding to some of these e-commerce uh, or maybe, you know, the, the Amazon kind of models? 
I think it could be yes in reference to yeah. your presentation, Ram. Uh, yeah. So I yeah I I do think I mean that's a that's a good question uh, because uh, I'll just you know recall a small anecdote that I had with Stuart Collis you know who was with Aware now with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So when Stuart was with Aware, I think uh, one of his uh, clientels were basically these commodity traders. You know, you have all these traders sitting all across the world, and Stuart would actually tell me like you know. Uh, they still rely a lot on uh, their own personal networks to understand how a particular crop is performing. Just to hypothetically tell you, say I might be a commodity trader based in, uh, say, New York, and I'm 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 keen to know what's the yield of sugarcane in Brazil is likely to be because that kind of informs my forward uh, contract positions that I probably need to take. Right? Uh, I think some of the early satellite technology, I think somebody was referring to some of the early emerging satellite technology tools uh, probably uh, will, will cater to those kinds of uh, uh, actors in the agricultural uh, uh, value chains, right? So it probably can give you macro level trends informing you about potential yields, et cetera, et cetera, which can help them better plan their procurement or the forward or the future positions that probably need to take, right? But for that technology to be granular enough and start informing around field level agronomy practices or field level uh, spraying and application practices, that probably is, is some time away. I think that's what even Shreya was actually alluding to, right? So I think, and, and also I'm, I'll quote, because I'm from India, I'll quote another example. I am, I am actually coming across some apps uh, that are using a combination of machine learning and some big data techniques uh, mm -hmm. to kind of uh, bring in a lot more transparency in the spot prices, right? So they're trying to, you know, combine a bunch of data points, prices across hundreds of different markets and then churning out some, uh, you know, derivative prices, uh, which seem to, you know, have a, a, a better income prospect for the farmer in the near and the longer term, right? So these are some interesting and emerging examples. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rob and, and everybody. I think we'll, we'll have to finish it there. Um, thank you so much to all of our audience members who've joined us today. Um, we'll be posting the recording um, most likely next week, um, including a summary of some of the key takeaways from each of the speakers. Our panelists, thank you so much again, uh, everyone. Uh, you're all calling in from so many different places or uh, different corners of the world. So I really appreciate it. Some of, for some of you, it's very early. For some of you, it's very late. Um, it's been a really engaging discussion. So thank you so much. And uh, I hope that we'll see you at the, at the convention later this year. Bye-bye. Thank you.